The Iranians were very much uh, relied on, on the fact that Russia can guarantee the stability in the region and can prevent external powers from getting into that uh, strategic zone. Uh, so that in a sense, is a threat for Iran. I mean, declining the Russian capability to guarantee the status quo there uh, is, um, is a long-term threat for Iran. I, I think Iran, in a short-term intervention style, will welcome EU's um, uh, intervention in a, for, for some sort of uh, mediatory uh, aspect. But um, the principle is that uh, both Russia, both Moscow and Tehran are against uh, any of these actors will come to the region, they, they create some sort of long-term leverages and they stay there. So Armenians probably can only, uh, would be able to use that blockade when they can frame it properly in the geopolitical um, um, uh, situation and see where that uh, converts with the interests of other regional actors. The war in Ukraine, um, as most of us have noticed, um, is somehow um, exhausting Russian power and Russian resources. So that is obviously impacting the capabilities um, of, of Russia in in using its uh, its foreign policy tools in rest of the areas of interest. We saw that trend in Syria. And I think uh, South Caucasus, despite this very strategic importance for Russia, is not um, an exception. Uh, that um, leads me to cautiously say that I think the war in Ukraine has somehow started a process that uh, might end up into sort of um, strategic uh, vacuum in the Caucasus, in which uh, there is uh, Russia as the main security guarantor, but a guarantor that cannot guarantee the security, so it's uh, it's using, uh, it's not able to use whatever resources um, it has. And then in this uh, circumstances, um, you know, other external powers and other powers might intervene when they find out that this vacuum is is emerging or is is forming. Uh, they get into the environment to to uh, to push their own interest or their agenda. And that is, I think, the most strategic impact of Ukrainian war uh, on Russia's capability in projecting power in, in, in important uh, areas like, um, like South Caucasus. And that is not a good news for Iranians because for at least for the last uh, two, three decades from the 90s, uh, Iran has accepted Russia's um, dominance, security dominance in the, in the South Caucasus and also in the Central Asia somehow. Basically, Iranians were very much uh, relied on, on the fact that Russia can guarantee the stability in the region and can prevent external powers from getting into that uh, strategic zone. Uh, so that, in a sense, is a threat for Iran. I mean, declining the Russian capability to guarantee the status quo there uh, is um, is a long-term threat for Iran. And, and in the short term, and as a consequence of this process, uh, you're noticing that there are more active uh, external external powers getting into the region, you, you name it, from Israelis to, to Europeans and everyone else, or even Americans. You know, there, there are, well, maybe not so uh, openly, but there are uh, a kind of uh, advancement of of uh, of presence of these external powers, and I think that is a threat for Iran. And uh, so, to conclude your first question, I think the post-Ukrainian um, war environment, or as a result of the Ukrainian war, uh, Iran is facing some challenges in the South Caucasus, which basically we are seeing in the recent tensions between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Well, uh, I, I think threats are more than opportunities in the short term. Uh, well, opportunities were uh, were mostly defined in economic and um, um, possibly through using um, North-South uh, corridor, which passes through Azerbaijan and uh, and links links Iran to Russia, and and that was, I think, one of the most important opportunities. But even that opportunity is very much now 
uh, influenced by this um, insecurity trend that we are seeing. I mean, the prospect of war, a major war, if Iran is going to intervene in the war, not intervene to war. So th these are all the questions that are uh, putting more doubts on, on, on that. So uh, I, I think for Iran, that was not, um, at least for the last two, three decades, a, a first priority to directly intervene in the, in the South Caucasus in a security term. And Iranians don't see that as an opportunity. It's more for them a cost. So in this process of a strategic void, uh, it, it's very much different from what we saw, for example, in Iraq. I mean, comparatively, if you see, uh, well, we had a similar strategic vacuum uh, in, in, in Iraq after 2003 in U.S. invasion of Iraq too, which Iran intervened and used that as an opportunity to project its power. But we don't uh, necessarily see that dynamic in South Caucasus because South Caucasus for Iran has a less strategic um, value in, in confrontation with the United States, while Iraq was important as, as the axis of resistance uh, to, to get close to Israel, uh, to, to be able to control Syria and, and Mediterranean, while you don't have that in uh, that di di dynamic in the, in the South Caucasus. Iran, by more resource um by pushing putting more resource into into the south caucus necessarily cannot um, gain a major leverage uh in regarding its great power competition while it has a sort of um, alliance or a good relation with russia well i think iran's agenda can be can be um framed in two main factors the first is that as i said iran is a status quo power in the south caucus uh, I, I think Iranian strategic thinking uh, evolves around the notion that they want a status quo. They want no major change in geopolitical dynamics, in the state structures, in the borders, or in whatever security uh, domain that you may uh, you may notice. And and that is uh, a key agenda that Iran is probably pushing for. As I said before, this status quo was guaranteeing was used to be guaranteed by a Russian. Uh, power projection in in the South Caucasus. Now that is under question. Uh, so what is uh, this shaping the second agenda is Iran's attempt to prevent the formation of new threats from South Caucasus. So I think if I want to briefly uh, say in these two points, status quo power and uh, preventing the formation of, of new threats, the second factor, the threats, very much relates to to the dynamics of, of uh, Israeli presence in the, in the South Caucasus. Well, that's that's an, not a new necessarily uh, issue for Iranians. Israelis were in Azerbaijan for years, as we know. Uh, but well, this lack of uh, lack of Russian uh, decisiveness to to control the region um, opens up or free free uh, makes makes the makes the Israelis. Uh, a kind of a freer uh, possibility to intervene. And that is where I think the, um, the the main threat for Iran is emerging. Actually, what Israelis are doing is somehow copying the Iranian model of, of uh, creating, uh, encircling Israel by going to Syria and Lebanon and Iraq. And Israelis are, are, are applying the same model um, to, to Iran basically means that going to the South Caucasus, to, to Azerbaijan, to have a spot there, going to the UAE, the Abraham Accord gave them that possibility. So what Iranians are trying to do is, is to prevent that formation. And, and I think these two big domains are shaping how Iran is, is reacting or how Iran is, is, is seeing the, the, the system of um, security system in the, in the region. But about your, uh, second question: that Are are we seeing any formation of security cooperation? I should see that 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 is um, might be a goal, but we are not not very close to that goal. I mean that that's uh, at least for the for the short term something that uh, unforeseeable. Uh, so, and there there are a couple of reasons for that. The first is that I think the region is in a transition period you know we had this change of a power dynamics the russian power dynamics now there is this strategic vacuum everyone is fighting for a leverage so you have eu getting in with, with its own mandate and agenda the israelis are coming with their own agenda iranians with their own agenda russians and turks everyone has its own agenda which is not necessarily comparable well there are 
uh, points which are, well, they, they have um, layovers between these different agendas. But what you characterize in this period of transition is, is a sort of competition between these actors to, to push their own agenda. So in, in this environment, I think what we can probably um, um, assume is a continuation of a sort of tension and rivalry, in a lower threshold, maybe sometimes eruption, until the transition period is is uh, is reaching to a point. And um, I need to add here that Iran's strategy in this um, in this transition period, I think, has been shaped by two factors: a combination of deterrence and diplomacy. Uh, Iran, for the first time, has moved its military resources toward the north. It is showing its teeth. It is getting more or um, more um, decisive into militarily intervening in, in Azerbaijan. I think personally, uh, there is a strategic understanding in Tehran that that Iran should intervene if Azerbaijan moves to change the borders in a meaningful way. Uh, so this this is a new understanding that is taking place. So basically, a huge part of Iranian strategy is moving toward a sort of deterrence uh, against any change of that status quo, which I was telling you. And uh, the, the second form or the second dynam dynamic is, is diplomacy, as we saw in Iranian uh, Azerbaijani uh, constant talks uh, at the foreign minister level, well, despite all the tensions, but these talks never stop. So it basically means that uh, Iran is basically is working on the two fronts, the deterrence and diplomacy at the same time, in order to keep the status quo and, and buy its own leverage in this transition period. Because, because the more Iranian military capabilities are dispatched to that, re that, reason, that region, I think we will see more leverage for Iranians. And as a result, uh, this transition uh, might be more manageable from the Iranian point of view. I answered this question in your uh, previous one, and that was the fact that this transition is not yet really um, uh, to, um, not, not yet finished. We are in a transitory period. I think none of the actors are have been um, have been able to uh, to push or to dominate its own agenda. That rivalry of agendas going on. I mean, th this is a very much a similar dynamic that we have seen in other parts of. The, uh, other regions around the world, like what we saw in the in the Persian Gulf subregion, that you have a constant rivalry over agenda, over the topics, over security concerns of each side. And uh, what I can say, I hope that there would be mechanisms, at least ad hoc mechanisms, uh, either bilateral um, or multilateral, that can prevent the tension to rise. I mean, EU, for example, has some good practices that. Have, have 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 been successful in uh, in Eastern Europe um, in to stabilize somehow the let's say um, the, the 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 tensions in such as in such an environment. So that could be an asset if if it brings to the region. Uh, I think Iranians, Russians, and Turks, for example, they have this experience of Astana uh, Accords that was helpful for them to 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 somehow shape their views over. Um, over a territory that is um, under under um, their um, under their attention. So I think again that um, South Caucasus needs some sort of a platform like that, in which at least those main powers like like uh, Russia, Iran, Turkey, um, and regional actors like Azerbaijan and Armenia will will sit together. And, and try to somehow, at least um, in an ad hoc way, to address the things. I think that that might be a goal, but so short, in a short period of time, probably we will see more bilateral, small formats of, of, of discussions. And uh, that is important to notice that neither Iran, neither Russia, wants an escalation there at, in the region at this moment, because both are pressed by their own issues and, and problems. So for none of those two main actors, that is a good thing to have escalation. I think Turkey is also somehow in a similar situation, given its um, internal um, politics, the election time, uh, the, the aftermath of the earthquake, the consequences of that. So all, all of these, you know, the, the main uh, actors are so much 
not in favor at the strategic level of of rising tension in a in a escalatory form so that is a good point start starting point to form some sort of uh, some sort of platform of discussion or, uh, among the among the actors but still we don't have that and i think uh, probably if uh, if if the current dynamic moves on we might be hopeful that that this ad hoc mechanisms might end it up in some sort of more stable platform of discussion in the region. Well, um, I think for the Iranians, there is one important principle, and that is, uh, which is shared with the Russians, by the way, and is uh, about, the, uh, about the principle that they are against any external actor to intervene in that region. What I mean is that they are against EU or Israel or US as external actors to actively intervene and have um, have a formal long-term presence in the region. Well, I think they might somehow interest, especially, I mean, from the Iranian perspective, uh, EU's mediation uh, mechanisms might be welcomed by Tehran in some, if, if in some conditions uh, are met. Uh, probably very much depends on the EU-Iran relation itself, but uh, I, I think Iran, in a short-term intervention style, will welcome EU's um, uh, intervention in a for for some sort of uh, mediatory uh, aspect. But um, the principle is that uh, both Russia, both Moscow and Tehran are against that. Any of these actors will come to the region, they, they create some sort of long-term leverages and they stay there. So that is a principle that they will um, will not accept. Uh, that So that makes the situation a bit more complex because on that environment, we don't have actors like China or we don't have a reliable mediator. Like every, every one of these powers are part of the problem themselves. They're part of the this, this game, right? So you don't have... Um, um, a reliable mediator or a mediator that is accepted by all parties uh, as neutral and also has the interest and strategic motives to, to engage in this process and to help the formation of the formats. Whilst, you, you know, you had such a, such an actors in Middle East, you know, uh, for example, going back to Iran-Saudi agreement, you had Iraq on Oman, which had their own clear interest of a sort of normalization between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It was China that was seeing that as an opportunity to intervene in the Middle East. Uh, but in the South Caucasus, you know, well, there, there is not such an immediate threat. Well, EU has its own strategic interest, but as I said, Iran and Russia are against EU intervention in a meaningful way. China is not that much really uh, into that region because of uh, various factors, maybe because of less strategic um, importance at this moment for, for the Chinese diplomacy. Uh, so th that is a black box that we have. And as a result, uh, I, I think, as I said before, I think we will face um, a, a period of uh, smaller ad hoc bilateral um, diplomacy um, mixed with a sort of uh, deterrence by all actors, the Turkish, Israelis, Iranians, and Russians, they, um, they, they will all resort to these uh, military deterrence forces in order to increase their leverage. And that is probably um, a process that uh, we will see in the next uh, in next uh, coming months until some new equilibrium will emerge in the region. Unfortunately, on the matter of blockage, you know, here we are seriously facing with the, with the factors of of uh, real politics. It's not norms or ethics that matters here. I think, uh, and and that's the that's the truth of uh, of the situation. So what I mean is that, well, I understand that on um, the costs, the human cost of that, um, and the national problem as a national problem for 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 Armenia is a very serious one but that could be only framed and can be only uh, um, helpfully framed when it is framed in a broader geopolitical dynamic so Armenians probably can only uh, would be able to use that blockade when they can frame it properly in the geopolitical um, um, uh, situation and see where that uh, 
converges with the interests of other regional actors. Uh, that that is goes to the point that I was saying before that for Iran, Brokhet matters because it is an issue of instability, because it is a factor of instability, uh, because it can it can it can it can, it can be a, a wound that's um, that can cause a pain in a long term matter. So then there there is a area for for pushing from the Armenian side uh, uh, in the in this matter. But I think. We cannot approach that in in such a very real politic issue, uh, from a very humanitarian dimension, which unfortunately, uh, in real politics, is very much the second factor. <laughs>